live from Miami Beach, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering .next conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. Now your host, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Miami Beach, everybody. This is Dave Vellante. Stu Miniman, Diraj Pandey is here as the CEO of Nutanix. Next conference, first conference ever. You must be thrilled. Almost a thousand people here. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's exhilarating to say the least. Um, and, and being the first is always special. Uh, and Miami, the hotel, the atmosphere, the perfect demos, uh, the vision. Monkey dance. Yeah, the monkey dance. You know, <laughs> all that. <laughs> I think it all just uh, settled down well. So we're struck when um, the conference got started. The keynote got started. Everybody expected to see you. It was your first customers up on stage. And we know we now know they weren't using teleprompters because <laughs> they were sort of fumbling their lines a little bit, which is beautiful, perfect for engineers. Who came up with that idea? It was, it was genius. I think it was a group effort. And obviously, Howard uh, Ting, our uh, SVP of marketing, is also a genius when it comes to really talking about messaging. And he's a showman, just like uh, every good company needs one, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and and the best part is that he's also had product management background in the past, so he knows how to weave product with marketing. Uh, Talking about the three H's, uh, hungry, honest, and, and humble. Um, and I think it's people who know you, know you as a humble individual. Um, maybe you hire showmen, <laughs> but you yourself, um, where'd that come from? What's, what's that mean to, to you and your customers? Mm -hmm. Well, so people confuse the way we deal with competitors, that that arrogance as, uh, oh, they're not humble. And I say, you know, within the family of employees, customers, and partners, we're extremely subservient. I mean, borderline subservient, actually. Uh, with the competition, we're a bit, bit different because at the end of the day, uh, we don't have an overlap of interest with the competition. Um, so we are a little bit, Schizophrenic, you can call that. You know, when it comes to dealing with competitors versus dealing with people who really matter, and I think hunger and and uh, and uh, honesty are just. I think it's ingrained in the DNA of this company now. Um, and I wouldn't say it's me or it's just everybody that came together said, "Look, if you don't build honest products, uh, you know, you'll actually get killed along the way." And that paranoia uh, actually has kept us honest. You know. You know, when we hired Stu in 2010 out of EMC, we said, Stu, pay attention to what Google and Amazon are doing and then project that onto the enterprise because whatever they're doing, the enterprise is going to be doing in five years. You guys must have had similar conversations and actually put that into to products. Can you take us sort of back to the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you go back 15 years, actually, not just uh, the founding of Nutanix, but 15 years, uh, when Linux was being tested in the enterprise, it was basically the web skill guys who really tested Linux to the hilt. When it came to IDE drives that became SATA drives eventually, it was basically the web skill guys doing it. MySQL, the web skill guys did it first. Uh, all of uh, Hadoop. Yeah, the LAMP stack. <laughs> yeah, all of Hadoop and the LAMP stack actually yeah. came from the web skill guys. Flash actually, the first mm -hmm. uh, mass scale use of Flash was actually Google and Facebook. Yeah. Fusion, Fusion IO, IO and, right. And then Google was using Flash for autocomplete and all that stuff, you know, so, uh, and, and from there on, everything is actually seeped in the enterprise. So, the architecture seeping in the enterprise was not anything new for us. We knew it was going to happen. The big challenge was legacy applications. What do you do about them? Because you can't just throw them away. One of the luxuries of web scale companies is that they just write applications bottom, bottoms up for the first time and uh, they don't have to worry about carrying the legacy along. So I think the big uh, thing that, the design point we had was, uh, what do we do about legacy? And we uh, very religiously said, look, we've got to carry the legacy along. Yeah, I wonder if, if I can you know, unpack that a little bit. You know, I think back to you know, the early days of server virtualization. In many ways, server virtualization helped me stick with my old applications. I mean, I think back, you know, 2002, you know, one of the earliest use cases I knew of was, hey, Windows NT, the server's going to go end of life, you know, end of support, I can stick that in a VM, I can leave it there, like, forever, mm -hmm. and I can change the underlying hardware. So server didn't matter anymore. 
Um, the big air gap we have today is how do I get to more modern applications? What's going to enable it? Uh, things like you know, uh, you know, platform as a service, containerization, uh, all kind of help that. Um, you know, how, how do you guys help? You know, as I said, there's there's the old, there's the new. Transitions tough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's Nutanix's role in, in that transition? Yeah, so um, obviously the architecture is the same both ways. You know, if you look at the scale-up apps or these old client-server apps, and if you look at, let's say, MongoDB or Cassandra or any of these uh, next-generation apps, we actually have a common substrate. The distributed uh, storage fabric, the app mobility fabric, they're all going to be able to work across both these uh, uh, islands, you know. And uh, the next-generation apps actually still need the 20 years of uh, tax that Oracle paid with uh, resiliency, availability, disaster proofing, all that stuff, you know, like how do you do data guard, like which is Oracle's flagship uh, sure. uh, disaster recovery product with Cassandra or with MongoDB? How do you do strict consistency? How do you do geographical replication, uh, synchronous replication, backups, and all those things? Uh, that those taxes have to be paid, and we just pay that automatically. Uh, basically, we've paid all that stuff in the last five years. Yeah, so, you know, what partnerships are most important for that? How do you kind of build an ecosystem? We kind of say, you know, IT today is moving from point products up to a platforms with extensible APIs, and you can't do it along. I've seen, you know, some of the partners you here, but, you know, is, is Nutanix the platform? Is, you know, where, where's the platform? Where's the ecosystem? How's that fit? You know, I personally uh, like the word platform, but I also don't like it because the the notion of platform has uh, an element of hubris built into it. You know, the fact that now you have arrived. You know, it's uh, it's the thing that really came together for everybody, uh, and um, there's a rite of passage to becoming a platform company. So, if I were to say we are a platform today, I'd be remiss if I said that. But I think working really closely with the application guys, having all our people, all our employees understand apps, you know, so, with solution architects and sales engineers and support engineers and our developers to really understand apps. And that we have done a pretty good job of, you know. When I say that we've carried legacy along with us on this new architecture, it's because of our understanding of apps. Uh, and not just apps, but security, better than anybody else, you know. So we have folks who really understand Oracle deep and uh, Microsoft deep and Splunk very deep and so on. So our best friends are actually going to be the app guys. You know? Because they are also the ones who, who actually struggle to get time to market, you know, uh, going, you know, when they actually go to deploy something. Like the Splunk guys, they suck wind when it comes to uh, time to value because it takes them forever to carve out a LUN from EMC and get some server capacity and then realize it's not a capacity issue, it's a performance issue, because the Splunk indexes won't work and so on. The exact same problem that virtual desktop guys had are the problems that uh, Splunk guys have, the problems that uh, Oracle database guys have and so on. They all would like to really figure out to embrace infrastructure that's invisible. So the, the Gartner guy, Ray Poquette, talked about mode one and mode two. Uh, Stu, you mentioned IDC, platform two, platform three. Are you like mode one and a half? Um, are you a halfway house? Or are you driving toward mode two? I wonder if you could sort of clarify that. Yeah, I think I would uh, look at us as mode 1.5 because we're trying to really take the legacy along with us, the legacy apps, although the architecture is mode two. You know, so, and this is the only way the baton would have passed gracefully. Otherwise, enterprises would have given up. You, know? you saw what happened to all the OpenStack companies. You know? They're nowhere, you know, nebulas and this and that. But they didn't think through legacy. You know, legacy was a very important part of building any large business, actually. You know. So I would say that from the app point of view, we are at 1.5. The architecture point of view, we are at 2. And the 2 is dragging the 1 along to get to 1.5. So it's like Vinod Kosla said, his son was under pressure to become a VT100, you know, look-alike for a deck vac. So you have that similar pressure. How do you fight it off? I think it's going to be a combination of uh, packaging and distribution uh, beyond just technology. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So DevOps consumes uh, products differently. They want to buy a commodity off the shelf and put software on top. So uh, quite a few of these guys would actually be comfortable buying software from us. Uh, and uh, it's going to be priced at scale with, you know, sort of, you know, let's talk about 
uh, how many sockets we can actually buy the entitlement for, so on and so forth. As opposed to folks who want much stricter SLAs, who will buy appliances from us. So we need to have the uh, bimodal way of distribution as well. It's going to be uh, appliances for legacy apps and software for next generation apps. And you don't want to over rotate to the to the future, or you end up like Nebula. Uh, at the same time, you've got to focus on the the skate to the puck, as Vinod said. Yeah, and I think you know uh, companies that get scared of uh, you know what the market forces are actually asking them to are the ones that die. Like you know, Sun was scared of x86, and they even scoffed at it. They're saying, "No, mm -hmm. Intel is a toy, and Microsoft Windows is a toy." Uh, right. And finally, by the time they came around to really embracing x86, they chose AMD as a partner as opposed to Intel as a partner. So it's too little too late to really get Opteron to run Solaris, I think. We understand that early enough to know that consumption models are things that we can't take sides on. Appliance is not the only way uh, in which people consume our technology. And as long as we have that, we'll actually be able to, which is why Amazon, I mean, we don't have an appliance in Amazon, we don't have an appliance in Azure. Form factors are one thing that we have to be extremely flexible on. And that's the way we actually straddle both the worlds, actually. Because the problems of consistency, availability, reliability, disaster proofing, um, network partitioning, all those problems are similar. Whether you look at the old world or the new world. I mean, a lot of people start feeling a little excited about, oh, it's all going to get end up in the app. The app is going to have all this value. I'm like, how many .NET developers and Java developers even understand the CAP theorem, which is this trade-off between consistency, availability, and network partitioning? How many of these, they, most often they actually want to go the other direction, yeah. right? having less detail, an abstract, and abstract, and abstract, and you know, I want to write a single line of code that instantiates a shopping cart. That's what they want to think about, as opposed to, hey, can I make so the layers below have to really go and do that, as opposed to the application itself. All right. So, when yesterday when you talked to the, the analysts and the press and everything, you said our you know our goal is to abstract infrastructure, deliver invisible infrastructure, and elevate IT. You know the challenge is, is if you truly make it invisible, you know how do how do you prove that you're valuable? How 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 do you just say oh that's stuff in the corner and oh wait there's four other companies that also said hey I'm I'm going to be invisible. We said you know we've heard you know Solid Fire, EMC, you know lots of others say you know oh we understand that you know storage especially has been hard. So you know how how do you make you know your the the, the people that buy and people that use your products heroes and know that you guys are are very important. Yeah, I think the way we're making them heroes of the future, I mean, take a step back. Uh, if Kodak engineers had seen digital photography coming, they would actually have embraced that sooner, right? Uh, they just uh, were too, too much in denial of digital photography, right? Uh, I think we have to let storage engineers realize, and even uh, virtualization engineers realize that, you know, keeping the lights on is not good enough because the public cloud is a real enemy. If you were to look at jobs, that's it, because they're not going to, Amazon is, might not actually employ you, right? you know. So if you want to really make your job successful, then you need to make the private cloud as efficient as the public itself. So don't worry about the fact that you have to give up on some of the legacy architecture. Worry about where the line of business is pulling you. And the line of business has a lot of people who are rebels. You know, VPs of sales rebe uh, rebelled and said, we're going to use salesforce.com. VPs of marketing rebelled and they said they're going to use Marketo and Eloqua. You know, uh, VPs of engineering are using At uh, Atlassian and so on. So the trend is there, and I think for all the custom stuff that they're doing, it's going to be infrastructure as a service unless they really go and make the private cloud as efficient. Yeah, I, I love one of the quotes from one of your customers uh, during the keynote was, the days of managing raid groups are gone. So, you know, there's a little bit of fear out there that, oh wait, you know, are you killing storage jobs? Does storage, you know, knowledge go away? But we don't think that. Storage is, you know, critically important. Um, you're, you're just kind of elevating them, allowing them to focus on the business even more. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, COBOL engineers who actually were able to reskill themselves still have great jobs. Well, that's the key, though. Yeah. I mean, if you're an expert at Lund Management, you, you better not keep honing those skills, you better find some other things to You know, and to we, that's why at. we have a great education department that's actually talking about reskilling a lot of IT as well. We're not just talking about technology, we're saying, let's figure out through Udacity and through our own programs, 
how people can reskill themselves uh, to learning the next generation technologies as well. So, um, a lot of talk about IPO at this event. I know there's not too much you can say, but it's clearly something that you've put out there. Your, one of your VCs, Ravi, was talking about the doom loop. I love that, that doom loop concept, which what he's talking about is, I call it the vortex of incremental investment. Um, when you go public, if you go public, there's that pressure to su get sucked into the quarterly doom loop, the, the 90 day shot clock. Now others have avoided it. And we certainly see the folks at ServiceNow and Splunk and, and Tableau continue to innovate. Do you think about that and, and how do you think about that? Yeah, I think we've laid the right foundation of uh, things like revenue recognition and things like that, where we're not trying to borrow from the future. You know, there's a word that people use for um, companies that absolutely must sell a lot to meet a quarterly number. And then there are others who just have deferred so much that the waterfall from previous quarters is enough to meet the numbers. You know. And uh, many appliance companies were on the former uh, path where they kept borrowing from the future uh, not giving enough to defer revenue, deferred revenue, but recognizing everything up front. They have to sell a lot of boxes every quarter, every quarter. And, um, you know, people even call that crystal meth. Once you're in crystal meth, you can't get off of it. You know? But if you have laid the right foundation of deferred revenue, where you're actually giving more to the future than actually borrowing from the future, then you do set the right foundation where by the time your quarter begins, you have enough coming from previous quarters, the waterfall from previous quarters coming in. And we've been a pretty disciplined company with that. So when, as and when uh, our books become public, you'll see that discipline from Nutanix actually. So, dear Raj, you know, one of the challenges in the Valley is there's, you know, always that kind of next thing. Uh, you know, you've got now 1,100 what you call the Newtons out there, you know. How do you keep hiring, you know, there's still enough good people to, you know, move what you're doing, uh, and, you know, how do you build a company to last, not just uh, to kind of hit the next thing? I mean, I, I said this in my in my short little uh, keynote as well. At the end of the day, we have to think on behalf of the employee. Uh, and if we basically just said, what are they trying to achieve when they are asserting themselves for a promotion or a career advancement uh, or a compensation? At the end of the day, we just have to think from their point of view. and. The moment we do that, it disarms everything. It just disarms the whole relationship. We're like, oh yeah, I think we know where they're coming from. And some of these people actually need coaching because they might not know that they're not as good enough. And yet there are others who are really, really, really good that might be underpaid. So we have to really look at both sides of the coin. And obviously we have to look beyond Silicon Valley, which as a company we have done, uh, laid the foundation of Se for Seattle and Durham and Amsterdam and Bangalore. Uh, as places where we'll actually hire talent as well. Because these are the places where the, when the, once the brand is built, the talent actually says, I'm willing to work for this company. That's what happened in Durham. You know, we're getting a lot of really good people from NetApp and other places. Uh, Amsterdam has great support engineers being hired from all around uh, you know, the best valley companies. And Bangalore is another place where we're actually hiring as well. So I think in the spirit of distributed systems, building a distributed system, which is not a single point of failure in the valley itself. And within the valley, valley, we have to figure out how to really take care of our folks and make them realize that they have a career. Because once they know that this is not just the end of all things Nutanix and it's only the beginning, look at uh, the, the most iconic companies, what they went public at and what they are today, they are 100x bigger. And obviously people are like, well, I want to make sure that I'm also relevant when there's so many more people. Uh, and we're constantly thinking about those things. And it's not an easy problem. I can't say that we have a solution. But if you look at culture at 1100, we're actually, and you can go and take a look at Glassdoor, for example. It tells you about culture of the company. We're actually doing better than many companies who are smaller than us. Now, that being said, I'm, I'm a very paranoid person. So I know that the 1200 guy can actually say the opposite of that. So we need to constantly monitor, measure, understand with surveys, and make it local. Culture is never global. You know, We have to lo know that the culture of China is different than culture from Singapore. Employee culture is different. The top-down mentality in some of these countries is different than the bottoms-up grassroots uh, strength that we provide here in the Valley. 
happy to put all that stuff together. In. So okay. last year at uh, at VMworld, we had you on, and it was coincided with the, the Evo Rail announcement, and you responded, hey, you know, welcome to the party, it's, it's confirmation of what we're doing. But there's been a, a little bit of what I call a urinary Olympics between <laughs> VMware and Nutanix. Particularly, you guys decided not to OEM vSphere. And VMware's kind of using that in their blog sort of to, to, to attack you. Can you clarify sort of that decision? Why not OEM vSphere, and what does that mean for your customers? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear to us that uh, we don't want to be a reseller of a technology. And uh, simply because we didn't want to compete with the channel. And the channel already makes, let's say, 10 to 15 points selling uh, vSphere and, and other such uh, you know, VMware software. And if we were to become yet another middleman, either we would have to bypass the channel or it would become more expensive for the end customer. So we were pretty firm about it. We didn't really want to go and do something that cannibalized the channel. And we are a 100% channel company. And the one thing that we obviously didn't want to do was to become the enemy of our biggest friend, which is the channel itself. So we're pretty crystal clear on that. And we went and told VMware that, look, we are an app on top of you. And there's Oracle runs on top of you and Microsoft runs on top of you. You don't force them to actually um, ship and OEM your product. Why should we as an app? I mean, that's what we keep telling people. Storage is just an app. I mean, why treat it any differently, actually? So I think logically also it didn't make any sense. If Oracle were not OEMing it, and Microsoft were not OEMing it, and Splunk was not OEMing it, why shouldn't Danish be OEMing it? Right, really didn't see any way to add value there. So yeah, why exactly. make it your core exactly. to your business model? So. Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit about Microsoft. Uh, you know, so some interesting things. If I look at Acropolis, it you know can help customers get over to it. Of course, if you talk about from an application standpoint, you know, Microsoft apps are one of the major workloads in a virtualized environment. You know, how important is Microsoft to your plans? You know, uh, I look at uh, the post Satya Microsoft as a Microsoft that's really thinking clearly on mul multiple fronts. You know, as an example. Um, they look up, frown upon the strategy tax of the platform. They're like, look, no more we look, look at ourselves as a platform company and the, the Office app has to work on Windows only and we'll never ship an iOS and so on. They've completely obliterated all that. And they have a clear thinking, like startups do actually, where it's a hungry mentality and, and humble mentality about the fact that there's no such thing as a platform. It's all about apps and it's all about customer delight. They also are a company that uh, really has an inside out uh, sort of understanding of the private cloud and the public cloud. But Azure is a pretty decent public cloud. And it's working at scale. So we as a company look at them aspirationally. Like, look, they have, they have a pretty good foothold in the private cloud, with, with, at least with respect to the app itself. But they also have a pretty good foot, foothold in the public cloud with uh, Office 365 and other such things they're doing there as well. So it's great to learn from them and actually enable this notion of hybrid cloud computing using Azure as an example. Now this is not to say that VMware software and the VMware stack cannot use Azure. We will make that work actually. A VMware stack in the private cloud working with Azure in the public cloud. VMware software in the private cloud working with Amazon in the public cloud. All those are possibilities that we are constantly thinking about and making work as well. Yeah, so, well. We've, we said at the top, we, we see you know, VMware start slowing down certain initiatives. You guys are speeding them up, paying attention to the customers. Diraj, really thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Congratulations, thanks for having us here. Great event to be at and Thank covering. You. All right, this is theCUBE, we'll be back right after this word.